Collins English for Exams. Listening for IELTS. Copyright HarperCollins Publishers, 2011. Track 1. Hey, Jenny. Oh, hi, Steve. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. How's it going? Fine, thanks. I'm so glad the exams have finished. Me, too. So, are you going on a holiday this summer? Yes. I've decided to go to Mexico for the whole summer vacation, six weeks in total. That sounds great. What are you going to do there? Well, actually, it's a working holiday. I'm going to work at a school teaching English to children. What about you? I'm going to Paris for two weeks. Are you going with your family? No, I'm going with my best friend. We've enrolled in a language school to study French. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Have a good trip. You too. Track 2 Good afternoon, Royal Mount Hotel. How may I help you? Hello. Um, I'd like to book a twin room, please, for next week. One minute, please. I'll just check if we have one available. Yes, we do, sir. Now, I just need to take down a few details, if I may. Yes, of course. What name is the booking under? Uh, my name. Duncan Jeffrey. That's G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. Uh-huh. And could I have a contact telephone number, please? Uh, yes. 5762-23821. When will you be arriving, sir? Sometime on the evening of the 19th. Of September? Yes, and we'll be leaving on the 23rd. How much will that be in total? So, that's a twin room. For a twin, it would normally be £235, but I can give you a special rate as it's low season. £210 for the six nights. Great, thank you. And how would you like to pay, sir? We accept cash, cheque or credit card. I'll pay cash on arrival, if that's OK. Of course, sir. We look forward to seeing you. Track 3 So, what are the differences between these four hotels? Well, the main difference is in the facilities they offer. The Hotel Sunshine is the only one which has a gym, and it's also got one of the top health spas in the area. It's next to a lake, so you can do water sports there. But if you really like sailing or water skiing, then the Highland Hotel would probably be the best place, because it offers great instruction programmes in these sports. Actually, I'm not a sporty person. OK. Um, well, what about the Hotel Carminia? It's a brand new hotel and it prides itself on its cinema and multimedia centre. And then there's the Royal. This one has a conference room, a meeting room and free computer access. But it's not really appropriate for children. There's not much in the way of entertainment. Well, I'm going on holiday, not to work, and it's just my wife and me. So I think we'll book with the Hotel Carminia, please. Track 4 so, there's a great walking tour tomorrow morning. Or tomorrow night, we could go on the cruise round the harbour. What do you think, John? Well, we've got theatre tickets for tonight, so we'll be too tired for the walking tour in the morning. But I don't fancy the cruise either. Why not? It'll be fun. Look, it's a dinner cruise, and it's only $12 each. I hate the sea, and I'll be sick with fear if the waves are big. And dinner? On a boat? I just couldn't. But we'll be in the harbour. Still. Ah, well, what about this? There's a bus tour tomorrow evening. It's only $5.50 and it goes all around the main tourist sites. Yeah, that sounds OK, but I'd much rather... Track 5 Where shall we eat tonight? Well, there are plenty of options. The guide says this city has hundreds of restaurants. What kind of food would you like to have, John? Well, I quite like seafood. There's the captain's table on Firth Street. The guide gives it four stars. Hmm, I don't know. The hotel receptionist told me the service is slow. But if you like seafood, there are a couple more places in the guide. Ah, uh, yes. Mangan's or Joe's Cafe. What about those, Sam? Mangan's could be a good option. It's nicer than Joe's Cafe, and there are fantastic views as well. We'd probably pay a bit extra... Joe's Cafe is much cheaper. But we're on holiday. I think we should splash out. That sounds great. Oh, no. Hold on, it's closed tonight. Oh, what a shame. Shall we go to Joe's Cafe, then? Yes, I suppose we'll have to. 
I'll give them a call and book a table. Can I use your phone? Uh, no. Sorry. I've left my phone in the hotel. We can ask the receptionist to do it. Let's go back now and sort it out. We can get changed and have a drink before dinner if you like. OK, good idea. Track 6 Section 1 You will hear a tourist asking for information at a tourist office. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. In the exam, there will be a pause of 20 seconds. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation related to this will be played first. Hello, how can I help you? Um, hello. Is it possible to book a bus tour of the city here? Of course, sir. When would you like to take the tour? There are tours in the morning, afternoon and evening. Sometimes it's nice to see the city at night with the buildings lit up. We'll be going out for dinner tonight, so we'd prefer to go this afternoon. Oh, and it's for two people. The tourist says that the tour is for two people, so the number of passengers has been written in the notes as two. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, how can I help you? Um, hello. Is it possible to book a bus tour of the city here? Of course, sir. When would you like to take the tour? There are tours in the morning, afternoon and evening. Sometimes it's nice to see the city at night with the buildings lit up. We'll be going out for dinner tonight, so we'd prefer to go this afternoon. Oh, and it's for two people. Right. Now, I just need some details. Can you give me the names of the two people, please? Yes. Susan Field and James Carter. Susan Field and James... Sorry, can you spell your surname for me, please? It's Carter. C-A-R-T-E-R. -E Thank you. And can I have a contact telephone number? Why do you need one? Just in case we have to cancel the tour and need to contact you. I see. Well, my mobile number is 07988 636 197. That's 07988 636 197. Now, can you also tell me which hotel you're staying at? The Crest Hotel. Oh, uh, no, sorry. That's the hotel we're staying in next week. It's the Riverside Hotel. Oh, the Riverside is a lovely hotel. Are you enjoying your stay? Yes, we are, very much. We'd definitely recommend it to others. Oh, I am glad. Now, I can book you on the tour at 4pm. Would that suit you? Alternatively, there is one at 2. 2 would be better for us, please. Right. That's booked for you, sir. Two people at 2pm today, August the 14th. You pay the bus driver when you get on, and it's £4 per person. Thank you very much. Track 7. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. In the exam, there will be a pause of 20 seconds. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Can I also ask you about the museum in the main square? I was reading about it in my guidebook and was shocked to see that the entrance price is £10. Why does it cost so much? Well, the museum has the largest collection of Latin American art in Europe. People come from all over the world to see it. But that's not the reason why it's so expensive to get in. You see, the building is very old and it needs repairs. The £10 ticket cost will go towards repairing the roof and the walls. I see. Well, I suppose it's worth paying £10 to see the collection. Yes, I think so too. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, there is. I was wondering if you knew of any good restaurants in the area. Well, there are a few restaurants near the harbour and a couple on the beach, which are nice. The problem is that the smell of the fish market is quite strong down there. Mm, I don't think my girlfriend would be very pleased. I know what you mean. It's not very romantic, is it? <laughs> my advice would be to go to the next town. It's bigger and the restaurant selection is wider. You can get there by taxi and it only takes about ten minutes. The town is quite picturesque. Is it for a special occasion? Yes, it's my girlfriend's birthday, so I'd like to go somewhere special. Uh, do you know any of these restaurants well enough to tell me about them? 
Well, I know about a few of them, and there are pictures in this leaflet here. Oh, this one here is lovely, the Bellevue, and it's extremely popular. It has a famous chef, so it's not cheap, but the standard of the food is very high. It's right by the sea, and there are wonderful views if you get a good table. Then there's the Lighthouse Cafe. You can see the picture here, which isn't really a cafe at all. In fact, it's a great restaurant, and a lot of TV celebrities and actors eat there. The place has been going for over a hundred years. It's quite an institution around here. Mm, I'm not sure about those two. They sound too expensive to me. I was thinking of somewhere small, not too upmarket, but with good food. In that case, what about Harvey's? The same family has run this restaurant for over a century, and it's reasonably priced and really popular with local people. Oh, and there's another family-run restaurant, Stonecroft House. New owners took over a month ago, and they're getting good reviews. There's a new chef there, and the food is meant to be very good. This leaflet has the contact details for all the restaurants, so you can just call them if you'd like to book a table. Great, thanks. You've been very helpful. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Track eight. Hello, everyone. Sorry to interrupt your class. I just want to make a quick announcement about our summer timetable. Shimmer's Dance School will be offering new classes this spring due to strong demand. Angela Stevenson will be back this term running the ballet class. This class will be on Tuesdays and instead of the normal hour from 6.30 to 7.30, we'll be running the class for an hour and a half, so it'll continue until 8 o'clock. This means we have to charge higher fees, but only slightly higher, from £8.50 to £10.50. That's only £2 for the extra half hour. Next, Janine Davis will still be teaching the tango classes. Instead of being on Mondays, these classes will be on Wednesday nights from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. The fee will still be £7.50 for the hour. Last but not least, Andrew is taking over the tap class. This class is for early risers as it starts at 8.30 on Saturday morning and finishes at 10. We expect this class to be very popular, as tap is a great way to get fit while learning new dancing skills. This will cost £11. All the other classes remain the same as the winter timetable. We hope there's something for all of you at Shimmers. Track 9 Internet safety is a big concern nowadays, and to protect your children and teenagers online, it's a good idea to monitor the sites they visit. Don't be put off from letting your kids use the internet. It's essential for their education and can help them make friends too. Now, let me tell you a bit about some sites we've found for children. Of course, there's a limited number of sites for the very young, but we would suggest one called Playtime Online. It's designed for children from four to six years old. It's really colourful and helps children learn skills for games. Children love it and it helps them when they begin school. Then from, say, five until about ten years of age, there's a really useful website called Moving Up. This takes playtime online a step further and enhances the maths and language skills of the child. Teachers speak highly of this site for child development. When children get into their teens, the internet can be a more dangerous place. Net Aware, for the 12 to 16 year age group, makes young people more aware of online dangers. It's a good site for your child to look at before they start surfing on their own. Now, all teenagers love chatting, and Chat Electric is a site designed specifically for teens from 13 to 16 to make friends online with people their own age. The last site is invaluable for teens studying for exams. 16 to 18 year olds love Test Doctors which is a site designed to help students revise for their exams and is full of handy hints and tips. The site is run by subject specialists, so it's packed full of information. Track 10 The Health and Education Summer Camp in the County of Cork in Southern Ireland is ideal for young people 
who'd like to learn new sports and activities. It has a beautiful location near a river and occupies five acres. The camp has two types of accommodation, tents and cabins, both of which are modern and comfortable. The cabins are by the river and the tents are on higher ground, away from the river and next to the washrooms. There are two washroom blocks, fully equipped with showers as well as toilets. We also have facilities for cooking here. We provide all the pots, pans and utensils. All cooking is done in the cooking area, which is situated in the centre of the camp. This gives the camp a real social focal point. Track 11 The Duke of Edinburgh's award is a programme of activities designed to help young people from all backgrounds develop personally. There are three levels, bronze, silver and gold, and for each level, participants have to complete a series of activities in four categories – volunteering, physical, skills and expedition. This talk will explain what you have to do in order to get a bronze award. The first thing you need to do is find a Duke of Edinburgh Centre near you. This could be your school, college or youth club. Then you'll need to pay a small fee to enrol in the programme. Once you've enrolled, you'll get a welcome pack, which explains the four categories in more detail. Then you can start planning what to do. You can do many different types of activity for each category, but you must get them approved by your Duke of Edinburgh coordinator before you start, so you don't waste time doing something which is not approved. The other important person is your assessor. This is the person who will certify that you've completed each activity by signing your record book. After you've completed all the activities in the time given, your assessor will send your record book results to the operating authority, who will check it. If everything is satisfactory, you'll get your certificate and badge to confirm you've completed the award, and after that, you can start working on the silver award. Track 12. Section 2. You will hear a talk about facilities for teenagers at a leisure centre. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. In the exam, there will be a pause of 20 seconds. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to find out more about the new teen programme here at the Park Hill Leisure Centre. I'd like to take you through the programme, the classes available, describe the building itself, and then give you some information about how to register and sign up for the sports and activities we offer. Afterwards, you'll have an opportunity to take a tour of the centre. We also have some taster sessions with our instructors, which we hope you'll enjoy and which will motivate you to sign up. Let's go through the classes first. As you can see from the teen programme handout in your pack, we have lots of classes on offer. Our instructors are highly qualified and have lots of experience training young people. Diana is our dance instructor and she gives classes in jazz and salsa on Wednesday and Thursday evenings respectively. Jim usually takes the football practice sessions but this year he is branching out into American sports and will be running the baseball club on Saturday afternoons. We think this will be very popular. So Steve will now run the football practice. This class has been changed from Saturday to Sunday afternoons. Steve will also take the skateboarding class on Monday evening. The roller skating course is for beginners and this will be taken by Stella, who was last year's under-21 London roller skating champion. So you'll be in good hands with her expert advice. The day of this course is still to be arranged, but it's likely to be Tuesday. We'll confirm the day by the end of this week. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. In the exam, there will be a pause of 20 seconds. Track 13. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now, some of you won't have been to Park Hill Leisure Centre before, so let me just tell you a little about the layout. 
As you can see, the reception area here is very spacious and there is plenty of room to meet your friends and have a drink. We also have brand new dance studios with floor-to-ceiling mirrors and the latest audio equipment. The dance studios are to the left of the reception area behind the swimming pool. Oh, no, sorry, I meant opposite the swimming pool. Both the roller skating and skateboarding classes will be held in the skate arena. This has also been refurbished and we have a new 5 metre ramp in there which is proving to be popular. The arena is behind the changing rooms, which you can see behind us, between the gym and tennis courts. The tennis courts are on the right of the arena. You'll see both of these new spaces on the tour later. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is how to join the Park Hill Leisure Centre and enrol for the classes. First, you need to complete an enrolment form with some of your personal details, including your address and telephone number and the name of your school. If you're under 16 years old, then you'll also be required to get your parents' permission to take part in the classes. Please ask one of your parents to sign the authorisation form attached to the enrolment form. You'll find the form in your information pack. When you've done this, you just hand the forms to reception. You can pay an annual subscription of £20 or, alternatively, you can pay each time you use the facilities. There is a £1.60 admission fee in this case. Whether you decide to pay in one go or with each visit, you still need to complete the forms in your pack and become a member. Once we have the forms, we'll send your membership card to your home address. All you need to do is show this card every time you come to the centre and if you want to book a class, you just need your membership number on your card. That is the end of section 2. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Track 14. 1. Glaciers. It is assumed that glaciers move slowly, but occasionally they have surges and move up to 50 times faster than normal. 2. Salinity. The Dead Sea is famous for the salinity of its water. 3. Humidity. The humidity in tropical areas can make you very tired. 4. Kilometres. The oceans can reach depths of 11 kilometres in places. 5. Pressure. Altitude sickness is due to a reduction in air pressure. 6. Evaporation. Rain is mainly caused by evaporation from the oceans. 7. Environment. We need to look after the environment around us. 8. Biology. Biology is a branch of the natural sciences. 9. Brightness. Our perception of the brightness of the sun changes with the seasons. Track 15. Hi everyone, how are you all? I'm fine thanks, Linda. Actually, I'm not feeling so well. I think I've got a cold. Oh no, Stephen. I'm sorry to hear that. What about you, Joanne? I'm fine, but I'm very busy with my biology course. Oh, me too. There's so much work to do. In that case, we should get started on our essay. John, do you want to start? OK. Let me start by telling you my ideas for the essay. Track 16 We've really got to decide who does what for our Natural Earth project. OK, Alice. Well, we've got all our cloud research, so let's decide how to break it down. Well, we should probably start by saying how clouds are formed. Good idea. And then maybe move on to the different types of clouds. We can separate it into low-lying, medium-level and high clouds. What do you think, Jenny? Yes, I think that's a good idea. And we should also make a PowerPoint to make it a bit more interesting and put in pictures of the different clouds. Good idea, Jenny. We should probably have cue cards, too. I'm useless at remembering what to say without them. Yes, me too. Well, I'm quite happy to organize everything we found out about clouds and make sure it fits into our presentation times. Actually, I'd better do that. I've got all the research on my computer, so it makes sense. 
How about if you make the presentation slides, Carl? Okay, Alice, that's fine by me. Well, if you guys are gonna do that, then I'll look on the internet for pictures of the different types of clouds. That'll be great, Jenny. I'll also make the prompt cards so we don't forget what we're saying during the presentation. Sounds great. Let's have a run-through on Tuesday. Uh, what sections does everyone want to talk about? I don't really mind. I hate speaking in front of people, so I'd prefer not to do the introduction. I don't mind. I'll do that. If you don't want to talk much, then why don't you just do the middle bit about the medium-level clouds? Yes, I can do the low-level and high-level clouds part. I'm sure Jenny can handle the summarizing, too. Thanks, guys. We can all take questions together. Track 17 Hi, Roger. Debbie. Hi, how are you? Oh, I've been struggling with my natural earth assignment. It's proving to be really difficult. The one for Professor Black? Me too. I'm writing about volcanic activity. What are you doing yours on? Acid rain. I thought that would be okay, but the process is really complicated. Well, I can help you with it. I know a lot about acid rain. I studied the causes and effects last year. Really? Oh, that's great. I've done some work on the causes. I'm going to write that acid rain is caused by sulphur dioxide from power plants and smelters. Basically, this reacts in the atmosphere to form acid rain. Ah, but it's not just sulphur dioxide. It's also nitrogen oxides. Really? Yes, from things like car exhausts. But aren't nitrogen oxides also caused by natural events too? Yes, they're a minor factor, but I think they're worth mentioning. But sorry, carry on. Thanks. I might add that. So anyway, these emissions react in the atmosphere with water, oxygen and oxidants to form acidic compounds like sulfuric acid. These compounds then fall to earth. Are you going to mention the different ways they return to the ground? Do you mean wet and dry deposition? Yes. So you've done a bit of background reading then? <laughs> yes. So if I've got it right... Acid rain often comes down as rain, but also as snow or fog. This is wet deposition. I'm also going to define it as any form of precipitation that removes acids from the atmosphere. Yes, I think that's a good term to define it. Dry deposition. Well, I think that's when the pollutants stick to the ground through dust. I'm not really sure how to define it, though, compared to wet deposition. Just think of it as any pollutants that are not caused through precipitation. That's probably the best way. Did you know that sunlight can enhance the effects of acid rain as well? No, I didn't. Oh, there's so much to think about. I'm sure I'll go over my word limit. Well, you sound like you know a lot about the subject. Just try and keep your focus. I've had the same problem writing about volcanoes. There's just so much. Track 18 Do you want to make a start on our Natural Earth project? I think our idea of a lightning safety presentation is great, don't you, Rachel? Yes, I think it'll be really good. I have a few ideas already. Oh, great, me too. I think we should divide it into two parts. What to do if you're inside when lightning strikes and what to do if you're outside. What do you think? That's good, but we need more. Something about planning for this kind of event. And also, what to do if someone gets hit by lightning. Oh, I can't believe I forgot that. <laughs> of course. Well, what should we talk about in the first part? I think we should say it's important to be aware. Lightning is always before rain, so don't wait until it rains. As soon as you hear thunder or lightning, you should get inside. OK, yes. And then if you're indoors, you should avoid water, stay away from doors and windows, and don't use the telephone. Or any electrical equipment. In fact, if you can, switch it off first. And you should wait half an hour after the last clap of thunder before going back outside. And if you're outside when it storms, you also need to avoid water. Try and get inside as soon as possible. There are certain things you should avoid open spaces, anything large and made of metal, and of course, the obvious one, trees. But we should mention that if lightning strikes very near you, you need to crouch down. Oh, is that right? 
I thought you had to stand still. No, that's actually wrong. You're supposed to crouch down. And put your hands over your ears. The noise can damage your hearing if you don't. OK, I think we've got quite a lot here. Only the last part to go. Now, what to do if someone gets hit? I think we should say that it's very rare for someone to get hit by lightning. Our talk sounds as if there's danger all around. We should try and make it sound a bit more reassuring. <laughs> yes, you're right. We'll say it doesn't happen often. It's just better to be safe than sorry. But what should we say about getting hit by lightning? Well, I think we should say it's safe to touch people who've been hit by lightning. They don't have any electrical charge. If there's a first aider around, then they should help them. Otherwise, it's just best to call for an ambulance. And we should remind our audience that 80% of lightning victims don't get fatally injured. That should calm everyone's nerves. Track 19. Section 3. You will hear three students discussing a group project on weather conditions. First, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. So, I think we'd better start planning what we're going to do for our group project. Have you guys had any ideas? I was thinking we should do something on extreme weather events, but I think Alex had some different ideas. Yes, maybe we should look into more localised weather conditions and the effects on the immediate environment. That's a good idea, Alex, but I don't think we'd be able to get much data on that and we don't really have time to do our own research. What about doing something about the seasons? I think the seasons might be a bit too wide-reaching, you know, when we take into account the wind patterns and pressure systems. Mm, maybe you're right. Well, how about Tom's idea of extreme weather conditions? Yes, that sounds like a good idea. It's easy to break down into separate parts, and it certainly sounds more interesting. I'd quite like to cover monsoons. I've been doing some reading on them and they're quite interesting. Well, that sounds good. We should maybe take two areas each. That would make it easier for us to focus. Well, we've got lots to choose from. We could do blizzards, heat waves, droughts, cyclones. <laughs> there are loads. Why don't you do blizzards too, Tom? I don't fancy doing them, but I wouldn't mind doing something on floods. They're linked to monsoons, I think, so it will be an easy transition. What do you fancy doing, Alex? Well, I could always cover winds. Mm, but that isn't really extreme enough. Mm, I could do hurricanes. They're pretty exciting. How about doing cyclones, Emma? I'd rather do heat waves and droughts, I think. I know a bit about them. I don't know anything about cyclones. Cyclones are really interesting. I can cover them. That sounds great. I was thinking about doing cyclones, but I'm happy for you to do them. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Track 20 Right, shall we get started on some of the content? Yes, we haven't got that much time. Does anyone know anything about their topics? I know quite a lot about cyclones. Do you? Well, I studied them at high school. You know, cyclones usually start near the equator. They need quite warm water to form. Above the warm water, the vapour in the air forms clouds, and if there is low pressure, then these clouds will start to rotate. Isn't it also the fact that the Earth rotates too, which makes the clouds spin more? Yes, that too. Once they begin rotating, they can either lose momentum or keep gathering momentum until they hit land. These ones are called mature cyclones. Luckily, as soon as they hit land, they start to lose momentum and fade away, just because they don't have the warmth of the ocean underneath. Well, that's a relief. They can still be really destructive. They are like a big circle of wind. They blow strongly until the eye of the storm passes, you know, the centre, where everything is really quiet, no wind or anything. But then the other side hits and the winds blow just as strongly, but in the other direction. It's just amazing. Yes, I would really like to cover that. Well, it looks like we've got it all arranged then. That is the end of section three. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Track 21 
my family isn't very big. There's just my son and me. I'm a single parent. For the last ten years, I've been concentrating on looking after my son James, who's now 14. But now I've met someone special, and we've just got engaged. My fiancé has four kids of his own, and we're going to get married in July. James is really excited about it. He's looking forward to having brothers and sisters in his new step-family. We live as one big extended family. There are seven of us in our household. Besides my husband and me and our children, there's my aunt and two of my cousins. I stay at home and care for my mother because she's quite old and can't look after herself. Obviously, we suffer from a lack of space in the house, but we all get on well. Track 22 1. Firstly, I am going to talk about the role of the parent. Secondly, I'll discuss the role of the child. And lastly, we'll look at the family unit as a whole. 2. Parenting is a difficult job because no two children are ever the same. 3. Families are important because they form the basis for socialization. Additionally, they educate and protect the next generation. 4. The family structure has varied greatly over time. That is, different times have had different views of what a traditional family structure is. 5. Many argue that less traditional structures are not as effective. However, there is little evidence to support this. 6. Many people are having families later in life. Consequently, the rise in the number of single people may only be temporary. 7. Families in other parts of the world differ from the Western norm. For instance, in some cultures, having multiple husbands or wives is the norm. 8. Although there are many arguments for trying to keep the traditional family structure strong, I feel the key issue is the economic necessity of having a normal family structure. Track 23 As we have seen, changes in the structure of the family are constantly occurring, extended to nuclear, patrifocal to a more equal footing between the sexes, and dual parenting to single parenting. However, a recent phenomenon in the UK, which is changing the traditional family, is the increasing number of adults who continue to live with their parents until their 30s or sometimes even their 40s. The UK has traditionally been a society where offspring leave the family home in their late teens or early 20s to set up their own home and families. But in the last 25 years, this has decreased. Official statistics released by the Office of National Statistics show that today 10% of men in their early 30s still live with their parents. This compares with 5% of women in this age range. The reasons for this are complex and varied. It cannot be denied that some people are choosing to stay at home. Living with parents can be an easy option. Food is provided, heating and electricity are paid for, and rent, if any, is minimal. However, a third of those surveyed claimed they are living with their parents because it is too difficult to get on the property ladder. House prices in the last few decades have risen dramatically. Property is now five times the average annual salary, whereas it was only three times the average annual wage in the 1980s. This fact coupled with high unemployment amongst young people, makes it virtually impossible for a single person to buy a home or even rent. The number of students going on to higher education has also been steadily increasing. Many of these students return home after finishing their studies as a result of the student debt they have accumulated. It can take many years to pay this off, and if the burden of rent or a mortgage is added to that, it can be just too much for a young adult's pocket. However, help is now at hand. The government is tackling some of the problems that cause people to remain with their parents with a new scheme. 
the Affordable Housing Scheme. This aims to help people part buy a house or flat by making housing more affordable for first-time buyers and possibly taking the strain away from elderly parents. Track 24 The family is a topic which we will look at in great detail this term. For sociologists, the family is often seen as the beginning of socialisation. Indeed, it is the seed of society itself. In recent decades, many old people have no longer been able to rely on their offspring for support, which was common 50 years ago. Many children are brought up by only one parent, something virtually unheard of before the 1960s. We can certainly say that during the last half century, we have seen an enormous change in traditional family structures. The extended family lasted well into the early 1900s, and this kind of strong family unit was essential due to property ownership. Housing often was scarce, and it was necessary for people to live with parents and take over the property when their parents died. Of course, people still benefit from their family line. Still today, people generally inherit any money that their mother or father might have. In the UK, the last 50 years has also seen a decrease in the number of offspring parents have. Whereas in the 1950s, only 10% of offspring were only children. This number has risen. Nowadays, this is the case for just over a third of children. Track 25 in Victorian times, the upper classes made up less than 3% of the entire population of Britain, yet this class held more than 90% of the country's wealth. This shows the massive gap there was between rich and poor, a gap which has shrunk considerably in the last century. Today, we're going to look at the wide differences in family life between rich and poor in Victorian times. Let's begin with the upper classes. The upper classes of the Victorian period were generally the nobility or the clergy. Most of their servants were very poorly paid, but were always accommodated within the homes of upper class Victorian families, so they didn't have to pay for accommodation, food and often clothing. The money which they did earn, they normally sent home to their families. Many Victorian servants came from the countryside, where the effects of the Industrial Revolution had resulted in job losses. Amongst these servants were cooks, housemaids, stable hands and butlers. The family would also employ a nanny, who, although employed by the family, was not traditionally seen as a servant. A nanny's primary role was to care for the children. She was responsible for teaching the children how to behave, looking after them when they were ill, and instilling discipline into them. Nannies did not, however, educate the children. Generally, Children from wealthy families did not attend school outside the family home. Tutors would come to the house to do this, and although on occasion mothers taught their children to read and fathers gave their children some instruction in Latin, this was not a common occurrence. Now, the Victorian upper classes had the reputation of being quite cruel, but this wasn't always the case. They were also quite charitable. Ragged schools were set up with funding from the upper classes so that poor children could have some form of education. Additionally, most Victorian parents were very proud of their children, who were often seen as prized possessions. This goes against the common idea that parents were very hard on their children. In fact, the opposite was generally the rule. However, the situation for lower class families was very different. In the lower classes, Child labour was rife. Children, as young as eight, earned a living as chimney sweeps for wealthy houses. Now, let's move on to looking at the lower class families in more detail. You'll find that very often... Track 26. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on changes in family structure. First, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. We are all familiar with the nuclear family, which has been the dominant family structure in the UK for the last 60 years at least. 
However, recent changes show that our idea of the traditional nuclear family as the cornerstone of British family life is changing. There have been emerging patterns which are eroding this structure, namely the rise of step families, cohabitation, lone parenting and the rapid increase in those living alone. We are going to explore these areas in turn and look at their effect in terms of the family. Firstly, step families are becoming more and more common. Step families are created when one or both partners have a child or children from a previous relationship. In 1980, the percentage of children under 13 who are living with one parent and their new partner was just 4%. In 2008, this figure had increased to 20%. The USA has seen an even greater rise. New statistics show that almost half of under-13s are living in a step family. Now, we can still call the step family structure a nuclear family, as it does follow the structure of two parents and dependent children. However, it also creates somewhat of a nuclear blur. Stepbrothers and sisters may belong to two family units, so where do we draw the line at which family they belong to? Cohabitation, when partners do not marry yet live together as a family, has also increased. In 2006, of the 17.5 million families in Britain, nearly 3 million of these comprised unmarried couples. What does this mean to the nuclear family? Firstly, the traditional view of a nuclear family requires married parents, so we can't put these types of family under this umbrella. Statistics show that even if cohabiting couples have children, they are more likely to separate than their married equivalents. Lastly, we need to look at the rise of the DINCS, which stands for Dual Income No Kids. As Clark and Henwood outline, many cohabiting couples are choosing a life without children, putting consumer spending first. Lone parenting is a relatively recent family structure, which has rapidly grown in the last half century. In 1972, only one in 14 children lived in a lone parent family. When we compare this with today's figure of one in four, we can see that this is a rapid increase. In the past, lone parenthood was overwhelmingly the result of a death of a parent. Nowadays, however, it is increasingly a choice. Some sociologists argue that this increase is due to the outlook of women. Where women once were willing to accept an unhappy or abusive marriage, now many will choose lone parenthood. Often, this can be just a transitory phase before they find a new partner. This view of women's attitudes and lone parenting is highly debated because some figures show that the largest group of lone parents are mothers who have never married. You can find counter-arguments for these ideas in Butler and Jones. One difficulty for single parents is that they are a social group who are much more likely to suffer from poverty and hardship. They are more likely to live in rented accommodation and have childcare issues. Lastly, an increasing number of people are choosing to live alone. The number of people living alone in Britain has more than doubled in the last 20 years. In 1990, just over 4 million people lived alone. Now this figure has reached 8.5 million, an incredibly rapid growth which has had enormous effects on the traditional nuclear family. This number represents a great chunk of the population who either by choice or necessity are outside the traditional family unit. Some think that these changes may not help the community. In fact, there are many arguments that this rise in alternative household structures will create a more isolationist and less community-based society, where close bonds, which are usually formed within the family, have no place. Leaving aside whether or not the housing even exists for this boom, an important factor which must be looked at is the disproportionate expense for those living on their own. By this I mean the burden of all costs is shouldered by one wage instead of two, and of course one person is using the energy which could be shared between a group, having a greater impact on the environment too. 
However, on a more positive note, people, especially women, are proving to be extremely... That is the end of the listening test. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Track 27 Hi, Dad. How are you? I'm fine, Sally. How's the course going? It's going well, actually. I'm really enjoying my math course at the moment, mainly because it's not that difficult compared to the other modules. Good. And what about the tutors? What are they like? Well, I've got four, and they're all highly knowledgeable. But Professor Jones is my favorite. I really respond well to the way he teaches. And are your fellow students nice, too? Yes. I've made lots of new friends, and everyone seems to be very hardworking. The course has lots of group work, but to be honest, this isn't really the way I like to study. I prefer to study alone. Oh, well, I suppose not everything can be perfect. I know, Dad. You're right. In fact, there is one thing I'm a bit concerned about. My statistics module. I think I might not pass it. Well, let's wait and see, shall we? There's plenty of time to improve. Don't worry about it yet, okay? Thanks, Dad. I'll try not to. Track 28. A. Excuse me, can you tell me where the bank is, please? It's opposite the cinema, next to the supermarket. B. Excuse me, can you tell me where the bank is, please? It's round the corner from the supermarket. C. Excuse me, can you tell me where the bank is, please? It's up the road from the supermarket, beside the cinema. D. Excuse me, can you tell me where the bank is, please? It's at the opposite end of the street from the cinema. E. Excuse me, can you tell me where the bank is, please? It's behind the supermarket, which is near the cinema. Track 29. Hi, Jane. How are you settling into life at university? Fine, except I don't really know what there is to do in town. I haven't had time to look around yet. You've been here for a year. Could you give me some ideas? Of course. There's lots of places for students. Firstly, if you go across the bridge over the river outside the campus and turn left... Oh, no, sorry. That's the garage. Turn right. Then you'll get to the bowling alley, which is really popular at the weekends because it's so close to the campus. On Friday nights, they have a special discount for students. Oh, that's great. I love bowling. So, do you like sports, Jane? Yes. I go running and swimming, and I play badminton. In that case, there's a running track behind the university campus, and I think they have a badminton court at the sports centre. Actually, I'm happy just to run in the park. Well, there's a large park in town, too. If you go down the road opposite the bowling alley and take the first right, then you'll get to the park. It's quite big and there's a lake in it. You can take a boat out on it. The university rowing team practice there. What about places to eat out? Are there any good student hangouts? Absolutely. There's the Elm Tree Cafe, which is down the road from the post office, in the opposite direction from the river. The cafe is on a fork in the main road, and it's quite an institution round here. OK. Well, I'll have to check it out. I'm looking for a part-time job, so maybe I'll be able to find work there. Hmm. You should try. They're always looking for new staff, and they often hire students. Now, have I forgotten any other important places? Oh, yes. You like sport, so I should mention the leisure centre. Don't get it confused with the swimming baths, which are down the road from the supermarket. The leisure centre is opposite. There aren't any swimming baths there, but you can get a student leisure card which will let you into both. So, you see, there is quite a lot to do in this town. It seems like there is. Well, thanks for all the information, Sophie. No problem. See you soon. Track 30 1 78A High Trees Street Sydney, 2316 2 354 Castle Avenue Edinburgh, E57HU 3 86 The Drive, New York, 45008
Track 31. Hello. Have you come to enrol for your course or pay your fees? Um, both actually. OK, that's fine. You can enrol here with me and then go to the next desk for fee payment. So, first of all, can I have your name? Yes, it's Peter Taylor. That's Taylor with a Y. So, it's T-A-Y-L-O-R. That's right. Do you need my middle name? No, just your first and last names, thanks. And what course are you doing? I'm taking a BSc in Economics. OK, that's in the Faculty of Mathematics. Oh, I thought it was in the Faculty of Business and Management. It was last year, but the course has moved to the Mathematics Faculty this year. Oh, thanks for letting me know. No problem. Now, where are you going to be living? On campus or in private accommodation? University accommodation. I'm in room 112, Ashley Residence. Did you say Ashley Residence? The one in Duke Street? It's just that there's another residence called ASCII Residence, so it's confusing sometimes. I don't want to make a mistake on the computer records, otherwise you won't receive any university mail. It's definitely Ashley. A S H. L-E-Y. Great. And what about your home address? On our records it says 56 Grove Street, Manchester, M19JA. Is that correct? Actually, there's a small mistake. It's M4, not M1. The rest is correct. 9JA. OK, I think that's all. You're enrolled on your course, so you can go and pay your fees now. Thanks. Bye. Track 32. Hi there, can I help you? Yes, I'd like to find out more information about the services here at the Students' Union. Of course, we're here to help you throughout your time at university. <laughs> so, what kind of help can you give me exactly? Well, our job focuses on three main areas. Giving advice and information to students, arranging social events and campaigning for students' rights. Right. And what about help with things relating to everyday life? Well, we have a team of six advisers who work part-time and have expertise in certain areas, including accommodation and travel. Oh, that's great. And how can I contact the advisers? Right. There are several ways. You can come into this office and speak to an advisor in person, or email us if you can't come in. And there's also a 24-hour helpline. You can find the helpline number on your student card, and you can call us at any time of day or night with any questions or worries you have. OK, and thanks for your help. You're welcome. Track 33. Section 1. You will hear a student asking for information at the university library. First, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation related to this will be played first. Hi, how can I help you? I'd like to register to use the library, please. OK, that's fine. Now, can I have some details from you? What's your name and student ID number? Simon Anderson. That's A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. The student says that his name is Simon Anderson, so the answer on the form is Anderson. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, how can I help you? I'd like to register to use the library, please. OK, that's fine. Now, can I have some details from you? What's your name and student ID number? Simon Anderson. That's A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And ID number? Uh, hold on. Let me look. It's A-N-D-105-763. A-N-D-105-769. No, it's A-N-D-105-763. Thank you. And what course are you studying, Simon? Geography. Is that in the Faculty of Environmental Science or Earth Science? It's in the Earth Science Faculty. Right. Now, 
Are you living in university halls of residence? No, I'm in private accommodation. Do you need my address? Yes, please. It's flat 3, 24 Lavender Gardens, London, SW12 3AG. Can you spell the street name for me? Yes, it's L A V E N D E R Gardens. And do you have a contact telephone number? Is my mobile number OK? Yes, that's fine. Just let me find my phone. Hmm. Uh, right, the number is 079-885-66341. Let me just check that. 079-885-66341. So, Simon, did you have a tour of the library facilities during your induction? Unfortunately, I missed it. Could you give me a quick tour now? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have 20 seconds to look at questions 5 to 10. Track 34. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. I can't give you a tour now, I'm afraid. I have to stay here at the help desk, but I can show you places on this map of the library. That would be helpful, thanks. OK, so we're here at the help desk next to the service desk where you go to borrow and return books. The maximum number of books you can borrow at any one time is 10. Yes, I see. Opposite the service desk is the training room, which is used by library staff to give demonstrations of the computer systems to staff and students. But the entrance is round the other side. Is the training room beside the quiet room? Yes, that's right, with the entrance round the front too. It's important to remember that all mobile phones must be switched off in this room. Of course. And what about books? Where can I find the books for my course? Good question. You're studying geography, so if you walk past the service desk, turn right... Oh, no, sorry. Turn left and continue on past the philosophy section, you'll find the geography section. The copying facilities are on the left. Now, one more important thing is the group study room and the booking system. If you're working on a project with other students and you want to discuss things with each other, you can go to the room in the corner at the opposite end of the library from the copiers. That's the group study room. It's between the sociology section and the TV room. The group study room must be booked 48 hours in advance. Right, thanks. Uh, can I keep this map? Actually, this is the last one I have, but I can make a copy for you. That would be great, thanks. Oh, I should also explain how you book the group study room. Oh yes, so how do I do that? You can only book this room using the online reservation system, the same one you use to reserve books that are currently on loan. I thought it was called the online catalogue system. No, that's for searching for things in the library. The reservation system is what you use to make a room booking. And can I access that from outside the library? Yes, via the library website. You will need to enter the name and student number of each student in the group too, so make sure you have these to hand when you make the booking. But all this is explained on the home page of the website. Once you've made your reservation request, you'll receive a confirmation email from the library to say whether your booking has been successful or not. If not, you can try to arrange another time. Well, that sounds fairly easy. Yes, you'll be fine. It's all quite straightforward, really. Thanks. That is the end of section one. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Track 35. Now, not only do we have lots of historical architecture here in the town of Tanbridge, we also have a rich variety of famous residents. Of course, everyone has heard of the famous writers Jim Harmon, Anna Collins and Ian Cheriton, or I.H. Cheriton as he is better known, and they have all lived in our small town. In fact, Anna Collins, the celebrated romance novelist, spent all her life in this town. She lived by the town square, where there is a plaque to commemorate her. She died in 1968, and you can see her gravestone in Tambridge Cemetery. You may know Anna from her most famous work, The Pride of Angels, which won numerous awards and for which she was a runner-up for the Herald Prize in 1950. 
James Harmon also lived here between 1975 and 1990. A best-selling horror writer, he got many of his themes for his haunting novels from this very town. He passed away a year after leaving Tanbridge, and although he isn't buried in the town, we do have a statue of him on the roundabout as you enter the town. Now, I. H. Cheriton has been the Poet Laureate for three years, and he lives in Tanbridge today. His home is the Red House by the river. Not only a poet, he has also written ten novels that have topped the book sales charts. He always does a lot of work for local charities, and is quite a gem in this town. Lastly, another famous resident of Tanbridge is Sylvia Daniels. She grew up in Tanbridge and went to the local comprehensive here. You can see her childhood home just across the river by the post office. Now, I am sure you all know her for her latest film, Planet Dust, which has just reached number one at the cinema box office. But she wasn't always an actress. Before she headed for Hollywood, you could have seen her waiting tables in the Dorridge restaurant here in town. She often comes back to visit, as her family all still live here. If you're lucky, you may even catch a glimpse of her. Track 36 Welcome to the latest episode of Film Finest with me, Liz O'Donnell. The films I'll be reviewing in this episode are What Happens in the Night, the new horror film by acclaimed director Jan de Neyberg, and Happy as Larry, a new romance comedy starring Harrison Wyatt and Sonia Smith. Let's start with What Happens in the Night. Set in a convent school in the 1950s, this film tells the story of two boys who are haunted by apparitions of monks. The film has the feel of a comic book, as it's shot in black and white, with occasional shots of vivid color. De Neyberg, the director, said he wanted some elements to stand out, and he has used color to do it. I would say quite effectively. He claims his inspiration for the film is his own experiences growing up in 1950s Liverpool. A believer in ghosts himself, he thought he saw ghosts in his school years. Ghosts or not, this film is certainly haunting. What Happens in the Night is a film that will scare you. I wouldn't say it's the best horror film to come out this year, but it's certainly shot beautifully. And it's not hard to follow. So, unlike some recent horror films, you don't have to sit in dedicated concentration for two hours trying to keep up with a complex plot. An enjoyable film. I would give it four stars. In Happy as Larry, Sonia Smith and Harrison Wyatt play two people who fall in love but cannot be together because of their families. The build-up to the film has certainly been epic, with gossip about both co-stars in the papers. Rumor has it that Smith and Wyatt aren't the best of friends. In fact, on the set, they barely spoke to each other. I have to say, though, this doesn't come across in the film, and they look like a great couple. Happy as Larry is a move away from the usual film Sonia makes. She is better known for her roles in action films, but she has shown herself to be a capable comedy actress. However, I'm not sure this is the finest film to do it in. Both men and women alike can get something from this film, but the romance angle is overplayed, and the laughs are few and far between. If you want romance, this film is fine, but if you want comedy, I would recommend seeing something else. I would give it three stars. Now, there are some new video releases which are going to be coming out in the next month. Track 37. Section 3. You will hear two students and their tutor discussing a wildlife presentation. First, you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Katie. Hi, Ian. Come on in. Hi, Professor Gordon. We wanted to talk to you about our wildlife presentation next week. Have you decided how to organise it? Yes, Professor. At first, we were going to focus on the cat family, but then we decided to talk about nocturnal animals instead. Yes, good idea. And how is your planning going? It's going well. We think we have enough material for 20 minutes. The advantage is that there are so many visual aids we can use. We found lots on the internet which we think will be really interesting for people. The problem is that this topic has been hard to narrow down. 
If anything, we've got too much information for just 20 minutes. How do you think we could narrow it down further? It is a broad subject. There are a few ways you could do it, but I'd recommend just looking at a representative sample of nocturnal animals, just four or five. Yes, and maybe we could choose one animal from each continent, or a land creature, a marine creature and a winged animal. I like the idea of separating it by different types of animals. And if we limit the detail, we'll definitely have enough time. But don't limit the detail too much. Also, think how you're going to interest the audience. Well, we're going to have a picture for each animal so we can talk through the picture. That's a nice idea, but don't limit yourself to pictures. If you can find any clips of the animals, use them. Showing brief video clips can keep an audience interested. I'll look on the internet tonight. And think of questions to ask your audience. People like to be involved. Yes, that's a great idea. Anyway, Professor, we've been practising our presentation and we'd like to show you a small section. Is that OK? Well, we just have a couple of minutes left, but go ahead. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Track 38 Section 2 you will hear a talk about the Yellow Plaque Scheme in Sydney. First, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Thank you for coming along to the Cultural Sydney Talk. I'm going to start by telling you about the Yellow Plaque Scheme, which has been running in Sydney for over 40 years and has been incredibly successful. When you're walking around the city, you'll see some buildings with a small round yellow plaque on them. If you take a closer look, you'll see the name and details of a famous person who lived in that very place. We have at present 130 plaques up in the city. The scheme has been great for tourism, but it was really started to raise awareness of the rich history of Sydney, both locally and nationally. And we think we've managed to do this. We also wanted to make people aware of the impressive list of important people who have lived in this city, and we've certainly achieved that. But that's not all. Although not part of our original aims, the scheme has also helped preserve some of the older and more important buildings in Sydney, because people now know that these buildings are a link to our past. Some of the buildings are actually over 180 years old, which for Australia is ancient. We actually think that this is where the scheme has achieved the most success, in raising the profile of our rich history. Of course, it has helped tourism, but not only that, locals also walk around looking at the plaques. It has been really wonderful in highlighting our past. Some people are quite surprised to see who has lived here. Take Errol Flynn, for example. He was married in Sydney. We are planning on putting more plaques up, and a common question is how can people nominate a figure to be put on a plaque? It's quite a simple process. Applications can be downloaded from our website. If you want to nominate someone for a plaque, you just need the person's name, where they lived, and you need three signatures to approve your application. Our panel then checks that all the data you've submitted is correct, and hopefully, within a year, a new plaque will be erected. But you can't nominate just anyone. A plaque can only be given to a person who is famous and has achieved something out of the ordinary like an important politician or world record-breaking sportsman, for example. We aim to have 50 new plaques up within the next three years, and we have plenty of funding to do so. Our funding comes from three sources, the local council, community donations, and the tourist board. Whereas in the past, the tourist board put in the majority of funding, now public donations count for 65% of all total funds. In fact, our funding is so healthy now, there are plans to expand the scheme. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 7 to 10. Track 39. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. At the moment, we only have yellow plaques for all the famous people but we are aiming to produce different coloured plaques so that people can do specific walks. For example, 
If they are interested in famous sports personalities, they can do a tour following the red plaques, the colour we are aiming to use for these people. We are looking at introducing grey, white and green plaques as well. We are thinking of using grey plaques to signify people who have done important work within the government and white plaques for those who have done good works in the community. Lastly, our green plaques we think will be very popular. These will be for painters and sculptors, leaving our yellow ones for writers, actors and other people of note. We do hope you enjoy looking at the plaques around the city. We have guidebooks on sale in the gift shop where you can find all the plaques. These are priced at $11.99. That is the end of section 2. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Collins English for Exams Listening for IELTS Copyright HarperCollins Publishers 2011 CD2 Track 1 Hi, James. How's your alternative energy research project going? To be honest, I'm a bit confused about how to do the research for all the different energy types. Well, the first thing you do is to make sure you focus your question, otherwise you'll have too much to read and you won't be able to select the key arguments. So how do I do that? Start with the general topic of alternative energy and then keep asking questions until you've narrowed the topic down to one particular area. Then, when you have your question, make a list of the reading you will need. This list should be general to give you some background, but remember you'll need to focus on the issues related to the question, so the reading list should also be specific to the actual energy source you've chosen, whether it's wind or solar or wave power. And then start reading? Absolutely. You need to start straight away, but don't forget to make notes as you read. Otherwise, you won't be able to keep track of ideas for future reference purposes. Yes, that makes sense. I think that's my main problem. I don't recall where I've read different ideas, so I can't find them again later. And my friends have warned me that not recording ideas in a system can really hinder your progress. Your friends are right. It's a common problem amongst students. You need a system. Anyway, once you've done the reading and made all your notes, you need to organise them so that you can analyse and think about what you've read. But I prefer to just start writing and then go back and look at my notes later. Hmm, I wouldn't recommend it. I think you need to give yourself more time to digest the material and arrange it into some kind of system ready for analysis in terms of relevance to your research question. Well, that's a great help. Thank you, Professor Jenkins. You're welcome. Come and see me again if you have any more problems. Track 2 Hi Mary, how are you? I'm fine, thanks John. How's your essay going? Not so good actually. Would you be able to help me with it? Of course. What do you want to know? Well, just the type of information you're going to write about. I won't copy you. I just want some ideas to get me started. Well, Mr Jones advised us to focus on just two or three forms of non-traditional energy for our evaluation. So, I think I'm going to choose solar. It's fairly easy to evaluate. Are you going to explain both the positive and negative aspects? Well, Mr Jones warned us not to get too involved in the ethical aspects of the topic. So, I'm going to structure my essay by using the advantages and disadvantages of each energy form. That's why I also want to talk about biofuels. I think there are more disadvantages. Oh, I see what you're doing. Using the negative points of one to highlight the positive points of the other. That's a smart idea. And what about the third energy source? Hmm, I was having difficulty choosing between nuclear and wind because they're both problematic, but I've decided to do nuclear for my presentation instead. Thanks, Mary. Chatting to you has helped me think a bit more clearly about my essay. That's fine. Good luck with it. Track 3 Hi there, guys. Nice to see you. And you. So... Are we going to finalise what we're doing for the environmental science presentation today? I hope so. The presentation is next week. Actually, I wanted to talk to you about this because I think we need to take out some of the information we're including. Oh, really? Like what, Shirley? Well, I'd like to suggest taking out the background details. I think it's just too much information to fit into ten minutes. 
But isn't it important to make sure the audience understands the context? I don't think so. And, and anyway, we could include the background details on the handout. OK, I'm with you on that. Chris, what do you think? Yes, OK, that's fine. I'll add the details to the handout. Anything else? Yes. I'm not sure whether the solar energy statistics will be too much for the audience to take in. There's a lot of numbers and graphs. Can we put the statistics on a handout too? Hmm, I see your point. We don't want people looking at lots of numbers while we're speaking. But without the statistics, I don't see how we can support our main ideas. Actually, you're right, Tom. I hadn't thought about that. In that case, can we delete the diagrams? It's going to take too much time to explain them. Hmm. Let's think about that a bit more. If we have to choose between taking out the statistics or the diagrams, I think we should opt for the diagrams. They're less crucial to the presentation. What do you both think? I think it's going to work much better than the original plan we had. Absolutely. We won't have to worry about talking for longer than 15 minutes if we remove the diagrams and focus on the main ideas and statistics. Shall we all meet again tomorrow to finalise the details? Track 4 Hi everyone. Sorry I'm late. Don't worry, Hannah. We've only just started. We thought we should go over the theories we've studied so far, so we're ready for the seminar discussion on Thursday afternoon. Of course you're right. I don't think I can remember all the theories related to consumer energy consumption. No, Hannah. That's the reading for Friday's lecture. Thursday's seminar discussion is about the current thinking on alternative energy. Oh, yes. Sorry. I'm a bit disorganised at the moment. Never mind. So, Mike, what do you think about the academics' point of view on nuclear energy? Well, I think I have to agree with them on price being a factor for choosing nuclear in the long term. Me too. It's definitely the most cost-effective measure. Don't you agree, Hannah? To start with, I didn't. But the text Professor Edwards gave us persuaded me... The only thing that concerns me is that there have been some disasters in various parts of the world. Yes, some texts warn of the dangers of nuclear power, using previous disasters as examples. I know what you mean, but I suppose the risk is minimal these days. What do you think about wind and solar energy in terms of the price in relation to the advantages? For me, they're just not worth it. Both are expensive, and it's difficult to predict the amount of energy each one will produce. You know, Mike, I'm afraid I don't share your opinion. This text here talks about the likelihood of improved technology, increasing the amount of energy and reducing the costs in the future. Yes, but that's not enough proof to be sure of the relationship between the costs and the benefits. Exactly. The evidence seems incomplete to me. Well, that's something we can follow up on with the rest of the group in the seminar on Thursday. Track 5 Section 3. You will hear students and a tutor discussing an energy project. First, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Good morning, Phil. Jackie, I hope your project is going well. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Hi, Mr. Jackson. Well, we've made a start on analysing the different forms of renewable energy, but unfortunately, we don't really agree on some points. OK, why don't we talk about it? Well, Jackie believes that all forms of renewable energy are beneficial economically, whereas I doubt that that's true for all of them. Such as? Such as wind, wave and solar energy, because they're less reliable. That's a valid point, but I don't think that's a large enough factor to disregard it completely. Exactly. That's what I said. However... Another drawback is that they're generally very expensive to produce. Yes, you're right. And that is a concern when evaluating their usefulness in future. I agree with you to a point, but it's likely that the cost will come down. I read a report in the Journal of Environmental Science that estimates the cost would fall by 20% over the next 10 years, which is significant, isn't it? Absolutely, Jackie. But you need to think about how difficult it is to predict the future cost of non-traditional energy sources before you believe the report. Remember, in your project, I want to see evidence of critical analysis. Make sure you've analysed all the information, rather than just accepting the information that you agree with. 
Also, it's very important that you demonstrate wide reading around the subject. I know. It's just that I'm not convinced that it's going to continue to be that expensive, especially if there's a demand from consumers. Well, what about if we analyze the costing process as part of our project? That's an excellent idea, Phil. Okay, so let's imagine that we want to forecast the cost of producing solar energy. How could we do that, Jackie? Hmm, well, I think we'd have to start by working out how many hours of daylight there are in the UK per year. The meteorological office would have data on that. Then estimate the number of hours of sun to get a rough total. And then I suppose we'd need to work out how much it would cost to supply the average home with solar power and then extrapolate that to get a number for the whole country. Good. And don't forget the price of power conversion stations. This will have a significant impact on overall expenditure. And there's one more factor you haven't taken into account yet regarding the consumers. Um, whether they would change from traditional to renewable energy? No, but think about what might make them change. Oh, yes. How much they would be willing to pay. Exactly. Well done. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Track 6. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. So, our project is going to cover three main areas. Firstly, comparing the main forms of alternative energy, solar, wind, wave, and biofuels in terms of production costs. Secondly, we'll take solar energy as an example and do a cost prediction. And lastly, we'll analyze whether they're likely to replace traditional fossil fuels in the future. That sounds like a comprehensive project with a good focus. Now. What data are you going to use and what approach will you use for the analysis? Ah, now that's something we do agree on. We want to use the reports you gave us in our last lecture and some statistics from the Government, Environment and Energy Department. In terms of analysis, we're going to use a cross-referencing method where we compare each of the government reports with the Robertson report and highlight any differences. Then we'll analyze these to see why the differences exist and where more research needs to be done. That is the end of section 3. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Track 7. OK, so to finish, I want to look at the resources available for researching UK census information for the essay you'll be writing at the end of this module. There are many resources for the study of the civilian population and family history out there, ranging from public to academic to commercial. Some are available for the public to access free of charge, whilst others are only available by payment of fees or restricted to academics and subject to registration. Some are more appropriate to family or genealogical investigation, others to historical population research. So, if we start at the beginning of the list on your handout, you'll see, firstly, there is the Family Records Centre based in central London. The centre and their website are available to anyone in the country who has an interest in researching demographic data. Their work might be useful to give you an overview of the general sorts of data and services available. Unfortunately, you do have to pay a registration charge of £20 for a year's access to their material. The next resource on the list is Genes Reunited, which is mainly for people who want to find out more about their ancestors. There are some good interactive tools on this website, especially the one which shows you how to manipulate the National Census Association's statistical data – Although Genes Reunited is very useful, it is used by a range of businesses and therefore accessing the site will cost you. Now, the third item on the handout is the National Census Association, which contains the most up-to-date data as it's compiled from official government census data every 10 years. Both companies and individuals are able to access all their resources without payment, so this may be a good place to start your research.
Finally, I'd just like to draw your attention to two journals at the bottom of the handout. The first one, Journal of Historical Migration, is not actually a journal, but a collection of articles on a website. Anyway, you might like to take a look at it because it has several articles on the importance of recording census data from a historical research perspective. This site is available to the general public, so you don't have to pay or register. The other one, the Journal of Social Demography, is only available using your university online journal's login details, as it can only be accessed by those studying or researching in higher education. Right, well, that should be enough reading for you. Track 8 Today, I'd like to continue from last week's lecture by looking at what helps people successfully integrate into a new culture. Whereas the reasons for migration are nowadays fairly easy to identify and largely related to employment opportunities or political instability, the factors behind being able to adapt to the new culture and create a new life are considerably more complex. Let's start with an overview of the issues as shown on this diagram. Starting on the left of the diagram, there are two lists of factors, internal and external. It's important to notice that the internal factors, in other words, those based on an individual's personality, are divided into positive factors, trusting others and acknowledging that people are different, and negative, being afraid and being suspicious of people. You might think that the list of negative factors would include discrimination, but it doesn't because discrimination comes under the larger category of fear. Now, what you should also notice is that the external factors are not labelled in this way. It's much more difficult to know how to measure the effects of external factors and whether they actually are external or not. The influence of family relationships, climate, beliefs and values, and the ability to communicate in the language of the new culture have wide-ranging effects which are difficult to measure and can distort any research. Now focus on the centre of the diagram, and you'll see this phrase, coping strategies. This is important because studies have shown that people who integrate well into a new culture, and that is any culture by the way, are those who have eradicated any negativity and made positive choices, and adopted coping strategies such as observing people, and taking time to listen and ask questions in order to diminish the effects of culture shock. What we have observed is that people who demonstrate positive coping strategies, such as observing, listening and questioning, end up by understanding the host culture better and integrating quicker and more successfully. However, those who choose to be critical of the differences and therefore react negatively to the host culture are likely to have increased feelings of alienation. This alienation can tail off and become the beginning of acceptance if a person has some positive experiences, but it usually deteriorates quickly into isolation. Track 9 Many people have immigrated to Britain and become citizens over the last 200 years, and in today's lecture I'd like to look at the various laws or Acts of Parliament introduced to deal with those people who came to live in Britain. In 1793 there was the Aliens Act, which the British government introduced to control the number of refugees fleeing to Britain to escape the revolution in France. Compared to today, when refugees have to complete a long and complicated application process before arrival, in 1793 all that was required by the authorities was that individuals had to register at the port where they arrived. The collection of personal information started in 1844 with the Naturalisation Act, which was updated in 1870. The main difference in the 1870 Act was that applicants who wanted to stay in Britain had to have served the Crown or to have lived in the country for at least five years before being considered. Both these Acts allowed the government to control the number of people coming into the country. These changes were fairly insignificant regarding people's freedoms and the amount of state intervention involved. However, in the 20th century, this began to change. 
The Alien Registration Act was introduced in 1914, and when the First World War broke out, all aliens over the age of 16 had to register at local police stations, be of good character and demonstrate a working knowledge of English. The reason for this act was to create a feeling of patriotism among migrant communities and also to stop spies from Europe infiltrating the country. And after the Second World War, the meaning of British nationality was redefined again, this time to encourage residents from British colonies to come to Britain to help rebuild the country. This was the British Nationality Act of 1948. The condition was that potential migrants had to demonstrate that they wanted to work and were fit and healthy. Finally, there was the Commonwealth Immigration Act of 1962. Legislation was passed to restrict the number of Commonwealth immigrants to Britain. Although many people still wanted to come to Britain to obtain good jobs, the Act now meant applicants had to get work permits, which were given mostly to skilled immigrants such as doctors. In the next session, I want to look at more contemporary Acts. For instance, the one that was... Track 10. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on immigration patterns. First, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. This morning, I'd like to focus on New York as a model for understanding immigration patterns in relation to national rather than international change. Firstly, it is important to understand that migration patterns are primarily affected by the rules of immigration which determine the conditions of entry. After that, internal changes can affect patterns considerably. To highlight my first point, let's study this diagram of Ellis Island and the process of admitting immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Upon arrival at Ellis Island, people underwent a series of examinations and questions before being allowed to enter the US. First of all, there was a medical inspection to ensure the immigrants were not bringing in any contagious diseases. Anyone who did not pass the medical examination was refused entry to New York and sent home on the next available ship. If the examination was passed, immigrants were required to take a further examination, this time a legal examination to establish whether they had any criminal convictions. After this, Immigrants were able to change currency and purchase tickets for onward rail travel from New York. Having completed this simple process, immigrants were told to wait. This wait could be as long as five hours before boarding a ferry to take them to New York City. This simple system allowed millions of immigrants to enter the US and is largely responsible for the ethnic makeup of the city today. Even though the immigrants themselves may have had a variety of reasons for deciding to migrate, it was only possible because of US national immigration laws. Moving on to the second point, how changes within a country can have as much or more of an effect than those outside the country, various parts of New York have changed radically in their ethnic makeup over the last 200 years. Communities became wealthier. Governments introduced new laws, and employment opportunities came and went. These factors affect where people choose to live or force them to move to somewhere different. For example, most people think that the population has changed in Manhattan due to the rise of its importance as a financial trade centre, which is true to some extent. But like the Ellis Island example, a change in politics, namely a change of mayor, allowed the city to boom as a financial centre, and this resulted in different types of people moving to the area. Brooklyn is an interesting example too, and we'll be looking at it as our case study later in the lecture. Whereas it used to be a predominantly working-class area of the city and therefore attracted unskilled migrant workers, nowadays its fame as a centre for up-and-coming artists and musicians means it has attracted a new and much more diverse population of middle-class residents. Finally, Queens has shown a dramatic change in its population over the last 50 years due to the airports there. This means that the number of airline staff living in the area has dramatically increased and changed the nature of the local population. Finally, 
I'd like to use Brooklyn as a case study of local change. Brooklyn's population has changed significantly over the years, and this can most easily be seen in its economic activity. Tracing the Brooklyn industries back from the current financial services companies to manufacturing in the 1950s to shipbuilding in the 1900s, we can map this onto average wages and therefore the type and class of resident. And this has affected the population density too, which has been steadily increasing over the past 100 years, from 1.5 million in 1900 through to 2 million in the middle of the 20th century to the 2.3 million inhabitants today. In fact, Brooklyn is suffering from considerable overpopulation now. But this large population increase was due not to employment, but the building of the subway, which linked Brooklyn to other areas of New York. Prior to this, at the beginning of the 20th century, the only way of transportation was the Brooklyn Bridge. Another factor which traditionally increases the desire for the middle classes to live in a particular place is the extent and type of local heritage, especially for those people with young children. In Brooklyn, this is evident in the increase in population after the construction of Coney Island. The modern-day equivalent of this is the restoration of Prospect Park, which has brought more middle-income families into the area. That is the end of the listening test. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Track 11 Excuse me, where can I fill up my water bottle? There's a water cooler just inside the main doors. Is this your first time here? Yes, I just had my induction last week. I'm Anna. Hi, I'm John. If you have any problems and I'm around, please just ask. Have you been coming here long? Yes, I've lived here all my life, just a couple of miles away. I started coming here when I was just a kid. I suppose I'm quite a faithful member. My brother and father come here too. Wow, that's impressive. Thanks. I enjoy it so much because it basically gives me so much energy for the day. It's unusual that I'm here at this time. I work pretty hard, and so I try to fit it in before work usually. I start work at 7, so I usually get in here by about 5.30. Oh, it must still be dark at that time. Yes, it is. That must take some willpower. It does, but it's worth it. You should try an early session. It really makes you feel good about the day. How often are you planning on coming? I was thinking maybe just twice a week at the beginning and, and then build up from there. What do you think? That's a good idea. When are you thinking of coming? Probably evenings. Is it generally very busy then? It can be. I came in the evening yesterday and it was quite busy. In fact, a funny thing happened. I was on the treadmill and suddenly water started hitting me. It was the fire alarm. The sprinklers had gone off. I was absolutely soaked. It was the first time anything like that has happened, but it was pretty funny. Fortunately, it was a false alarm. <laughs> so much excitement at the gym. I think I'm going to enjoy this. Track 12 Thank you for taking the time to see me today, Mr Jones. I'd just like to take a minute to outline our new step machines. No problem. I'm interested in getting a few. We don't have any in the gym yet. That's great. Well, let me talk you through the build of the step machine. If you have a look at the sales brochure, you can see what they look like on page 14. OK. These machines are two metres tall, so they tend to stand out. The tallest part is the holding frame. At the top there, we have the main grips. These grips, when they are held, monitor heart rate so that the user can check they are working out at their optimum heart rate. That's great. And where does this rate show up? They'll be able to see it on the screen below. This screen is fully digital and shows not only their heart rate, but the number of steps they've taken and the distance they've travelled. On the panel there, they also have a selection of workouts. They can set it by distance or time, or by the amount of calories they want to burn. They can even set it to climb a famous mountain or hill, or walk up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, for example. <laughs> That's great. I like those more fun settings. And the great thing is you can have people climbing up Mount Everest, for example, every day for 10 years, and this machine will still be in perfect working order. It's made to last. It not only has a metallic spine, but durable pedals made from the most high-tech materials on the market. And the machine works via a wheel in the centre. That's unusual, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. But we find a central wheel lasts much longer than a pump system. The central wheel is attached to a bracket, which ensures each step movement is as smooth as the last. Uh, the final feature I should point out to you is the side supports, which ensure safety for all machine users. If users feel tired, they can hold on to these and slow down their stepping. I see. Well, I think I might take three of them. Track 13 OK, Alice. I just need a few more details to start your membership. Your full name is Alice Wilson, yes? No, Watson. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Which age range are you? Well, I'm just out of the 16 to 25 bracket. I'm 26 now. Great. 26 to 35? Yes. And do you have any health problems which may affect your exercise? No, I don't have any health conditions. I'll put none. Do you do any exercise at the moment? Not much. I exercise a couple of times a week. And what do you do? Well, I used to play tennis, but I stopped. Now I only go swimming. OK. And why have you decided to join up? Just to improve my fitness. I don't want to lose any weight or build muscles or anything. Fine. Well, I would recommend doing the Level 2 workout programme to begin with. It takes about 40 minutes to do the whole programme. I'll get you an information sheet so you can see what it involves. Track 14 Hi, Penny. How are you doing? Have you just been to the gym? Hi, Debbie. I'm good, thanks. Yes, I've just finished a workout. How are you? Yes, good. I'm planning on going to the gym later, but it's hard finding the time now I've got a child. <laughs> I bet it is. Have you tried any of their new exercise classes? Yes, I tried some last week. I wanted to go to yoga, but it was full up. I went to the dance class instead. It was really fun. Oh, and kickboxing last Thursday, too. <laughs> That was exhausting. Well, you didn't miss much at yoga. I went there last Friday and it was far too hard. I couldn't do most of the exercises. Oh, no. Are you going to try anything else? Well, I was thinking of trying the aerobics class. My friend did that one and said the instructor was awful. Well, I'll probably give it a miss then. I've got to go to a conference next week anyway, so I'll be away from Tuesday to Friday. Oh, lucky you. Track 15. Section 1. You will hear a conversation in a gym between a customer and a receptionist. First, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 3. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation related to this will be played first. Hello and welcome to Smith's Gym. Hi there. I'd like to become a member. Yes, of course. We just need to fill out a couple of forms and then I can show you around the gym. That would be great. Let's start with the membership form. Can I have your name, please? Yes, sure. Brad Simmons. Is that Simmons with a D or without? Without. S-I-M-M-O-N-S. -M the customer says that his surname is Simmons, so this is written as the answer. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello and welcome to Smith's Gym. Hi there. I'd like to become a member. Yes, of course. We just need to fill out a couple of forms and then I can show you around the gym. That would be great. Let's start with the membership form. Can I have your name, please? Yes, sure. Brad Simmons. Is that Simmons with a D or without? Without. S I M M O N S. Got it. And can I take a contact number, please? Yes, yeah, sure. It's 04983 5521. Okay. 04983 55531. No, uh, it's 21 at the end. Great. And do you have an email address? Yes, brad07 at elmnet.com. That's E-L-E-M-N-E-T dot com. Right. Now, we've got three membership types here. 
bronze, which is just off peak and costs £21 a month. Silver, which means you can use the gym at all times. This is £36.50. Or for just £5 more, you can get a gold membership, which gives you free access to the squash and tennis courts and all classes. For now, I think I'll just take the silver. That's fine, sir. That'll be £36.50 a month. Great. When can I start? Well, you'll need to have an induction first. We have spaces at 2.30, 4.45 and 8.15 tomorrow. Would any of these be suitable? I can't do tomorrow. Do you have anything for Saturday? Is that the 12th of November? No, it's the 11th. Yes. Yes, that's fine. Would 2.30 be OK? That's fine. I'll book you in with our trainer, Rob Ellis. Now, would you like me to show you around? That would be great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have 20 seconds to look at questions 4 to 10. Track 16. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. OK, follow me. Let's go up the stairs to the main equipment room. As you can see, we have all the treadmills, bikes and rowing machines in here, and the weights are in the corner. Great. And is that the pool over there? Can I use that with my membership? Yes, at any time. Just go through the glass doors on the left. As you can see, the pool is dominated by the diving board at the far end. It's impressively tall. And on the right-hand side of the pool, you can see we have two lanes. The first one is a slow lane for those who are trying to improve their fitness. It gets really busy. The lane on the far right is what we call the club lane because we reserve this for people who have membership. It is slightly less busy and the members can get a really good workout in it. That sounds great. Yes, it is good. And then near us, you can see a smaller area sectioned off nearly halfway across the pool. This area is where we put the school groups which come in the late afternoons during the week, usually from about four. We keep them confined to that space so that the other end can be used for free swimming. And what is the little round pool for? We call that the toddler's pool. It's not very deep and the mothers often bring their children in to teach them to swim in it. Great. Well, I'm glad I can use the pool. It will be good to vary my exercise. Definitely. When do you think you'll be coming? Most likely in the evenings. I'd like to come on Saturdays, but I often work then, so I think I'll have to miss that day and then come on Sundays. Oh, so you'll be a regular visitor. That's great news. Can I ask why you chose Smith's Gym? Well, actually, the television advert prompted me to join. It makes exercising look so much fun. I always thought going to the gym would be monotonous. No, not at all. It can be a lot of fun. My aim is to reach my optimum fitness. At the moment, I think I'm a bit unhealthy, so I'd like to change that. Well, give it some time and I'm sure you will. Now, shall we go back and complete the payment details? That is the end of section one. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Track 17. One. Revenue. Two. Thrive. Three. Commission. Four. Collaborate. Five. Franchise. Six. Restructure. Seven. Audit. Eight. Subsidiary. Track 18. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to talk to you all about the department restructure and how it will affect our work. As you know, the company is expanding and this means we'll need to recruit more staff and optimise our ways of working. So I want to look at each of our teams and the changes which are planned to start next month. The sales team, headed by Gary Wilson, will be responsible for not only increasing the amount of business we do with our current customers, but also searching out new clients. As this is likely to be a labour-intensive task, Gary's team will need more staff, which is where Linda French's human resources team comes in. 
Linda and Gary will collaborate on finding and employing 20 new sales members as soon as possible. However, not all staff will be recruited from outside. If this company is going to continue to thrive, each of the current team managers will need an assistant and these positions will be internal appointments. Human Resources are sending out an email to all staff this week asking them if they would like to apply for one of the new positions and interviews will begin next month. Now, in order for the sales team to increase revenue, the research and development team have to come up with some innovative products which will be better than those offered by other companies. Therefore, Zoe's team will start a month-long project to learn more about what our competitors make to help inform our design process. Their target will be to design and create two new ranges of products this year. As always, if any of you have an idea for a product, please contact Zoe about it. All ideas are welcome. Lastly, but just as importantly, I'd like to talk about Ian Smith's team. Obviously, aftercare service is crucial to the expansion of the company, so IT support will be making sure that all our customers are called to discuss our service as part of the follow-up system. Ian's team will also be upgrading our client support package to facilitate 24-hour access, seven days a week. Ian believes strongly that this will increase our competitiveness and be a real selling point for potential customers. Track 19 Welcome to this fire evacuation talk everyone. I'm Melanie Brooks, the fire safety manager here at TechBase and my office is on the fourth floor if you ever need to find me. Today I want to run through the fire evacuation procedure now that we're in a new building. First of all, can I just remind you that if you hear the fire alarm you should always head towards the main stairs in order to leave the building. Please assume that the alarm is real, except if it sounds at 11am on a Tuesday. At this time, it's always a test, we hope. It's vital that you do not spend time collecting your bags or personal belongings because this wastes valuable evacuation time. When you have left the building, please look for the fire marshals who will be wearing fluorescent orange jackets. They'll show you where the waiting area is, but just so you know, it's the park at the rear of the office block. Your department has a fire safety officer, uh, I believe it's Susan Jenkins, and it's her job to make sure that everyone who signed in has vacated the building. Susan will then tell the fire safety manager if there are any missing people. Can I also remind you that you mustn't enter the building again until the fire safety manager, in other words, me, tells you that the situation is no longer dangerous. Track 20 Right team, this afternoon I want to go over the new marketing and advertising strategy so that everyone is clear on the streams for each of our product ranges. Let's start with toys for children. Now, last year most of the advertising was done through leaflets posted through people's letterboxes across the city. However, the products are now selling well nationally in department stores rather than just in our local shop here in Leeds. So, we're going to expand the budget and use print media. By this, I mean the national newspapers, in order to maximise the exposure to these products. And despite the fact that our competitors advertise baby clothes on TV, we won't be using this method, as our statistics show that it's just not cost-effective. People don't pay much attention to TV ads for baby clothes, but we believe a picture in the newspapers will be much more attractive to potential customers, we're going with this method. As far as clothing for expectant mothers is concerned, the campaign will move from newspapers to the internet due to the fact that we've seen an increase in internet shopping for clothes among women in general. And finally, baby food. Adverts for this are difficult to place and we've previously tried ads in all three media. Anyway, although our analysis has shown that the internet is one possibility, we're going to continue using television. Many other types of food are also advertised on TV and happy mothers and babies make a very strong image. Track 21 Section 2 You will hear a talk about a company by a chief executive. First, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 6. 
Now listen carefully and answer questions one to six. I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to our annual meeting and thanking you all for your hard work. It's been a great year for us in terms of expansion and optimizing business opportunities, and I'm pleased to say that Benchmark Consulting is a thriving, successful company. I'd like to take this opportunity to give you an overview of where the company began and where we'll be going in the next ten years. For those of you who've been with the company since the start, sorry if you already know all this, but we have so many new staff members that I thought it would be worth filling in some background information. Benchmark Consulting was set up in 2000 by James Cox, a local entrepreneur who opened the first office in Melbourne. His real achievement was to create a new consultancy system which enabled clients to see which of the key areas of their business needed strengthening. James was incredibly successful with his system and started the company off on a journey of expansion. He retired in 2006 and was succeeded by Fred Montgomery. Fred shared James's views on consulting and continued the expansion. He increased revenue to $5 million and opened a new office in Perth. Soon the benchmark consulting system had become just that, the benchmark for many other consulting firms, and Fred took the opportunity to sell Benchmark for $10 million in 2008. Our new owners are, as you know, TFB Group Limited, and their investment has allowed us to build our brand new headquarters here in Sydney. TFB Group have brought us more exposure at a national level, and our most recent success has been winning a contract with the Government of Australia, advising on management restructuring. Now, we ourselves have done a little reorganisation over the last year to maximise our productivity. We've thought long and hard about the best location for the marketing department, as this is the key to facilitating our future business. Although Perth has a large number of marketing companies, which enables us to learn from our competitors, it's Melbourne that's the gateway to international connections, and therefore we've decided to move all marketing operations there. In terms of professional development, we wanted to optimise the training programmes available to our staff because training is vital if we want to remain competitive. As a result, staff training will no longer be here in Sydney, but instead will take place in the Perth office, where new facilities have been installed. Finally, we've looked at how to optimise our back office administrative functions. Currently, each office has its own admin department. However, this is proving to be less efficient than we would like. In order to resolve this situation, all these functions will now be centralised here in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 7 to 10. Track 22. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So, what does all this mean for the future? Well, after 10 years, I've decided that Benchmark needs a new vision for the future. I think it's time for us to divide up parts of the business into smaller units. Therefore, over the next five years, I aim to set up two small subsidiary companies in order to focus on international expansion in Europe and Asia. There are many organisations in emerging markets which could benefit from our experience and skills. Which leads me to the next point for future development, that of increasing our workforce. It's become clear that all our departments are understaffed, so we'll be taking on more employees over the next year. And the really good news is that to make us a desirable employer, all positions, current and future, will receive a salary increase of 10%. Lastly, I know that some people are worried about the financial aspects of having to move to another city as part of the restructure, so Benchmark will be providing a relocation package to all employees thus affected. This is because we would like you all to remain with the company for the foreseeable future. That is the end of Section 2. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Track 23. 1. 
When I was living in Ireland, it was quite difficult to understand the local accent. Two. Do you think it's important to sound like a native speaker? Three. I would have learnt Latin, but it wasn't an option when I was at school. Track 24. 1. Many of the dialects in the world are gradually dying out. 2. Can you recommend ways in which I can improve my listening skills? 3. I'm researching minority languages for my essay, so I went to the British Library to find out more information. Track 25 Learning a language isn't easy. Learning a language isn't easy. Track 26 1. There are many South American Indian languages, none of which are related to Spanish. 2. Studying accents is a good way to understand if a language is changing or not. Track 27 1. I stopped taking Greek lessons soon after I left school. 2. How will local languages stay in use if fewer people learn them? Track 28 Morning everyone, how are you? Fine, thanks, Joe. Yeah, fine, Joe. Have you managed to do much research on our minority languages project? Well, Julia, I've been having some trouble finding information about the number of Cornish speakers in the UK. The records at the Office of National Statistics and the Cornish Language Council say different things, so I'm not sure who to believe. Hmm. Susan, have you got any information about this? I was looking on the government's minority languages website and it says that nearly half the minority language speakers in the UK are speakers of Welsh. Are you sure it's nearly half? I thought the number of Gaelic and Welsh speakers was more or less the same. It used to be when Gaelic was a compulsory subject in schools, but nowadays there are fewer speakers of Gaelic compared to Welsh. And apparently, with Cornish, it's difficult to know the exact percentage of the population who speak it, because most people only speak it to intermediate level. Very few people are fluent speakers. I suppose that's why the statistics are different. Well, I think we should go with the more conservative estimate based on the number of fluent speakers. I think you're right, which means that Cornish isn't spoken by nearly as many people as the other languages. Yes, I think that's right too. Based on fluent speakers, that means that Welsh is the most widely spoken and the numbers of Irish and Gaelic speakers are more or less the same. Track 29 Right, Harry, Rob, shall we get started on this presentation for European studies? Well, how about if I start by talking about the central regions of Spain where most people speak Spanish? Good idea. It's important we make it clear that the majority of the population use Spanish as their main language. Then I can introduce the Galician accent of the Northwest. But isn't Galician more of a dialect? Oh, yes, you're right. We've got to get our terminology correct, because Spain is complicated in terms of languages and dialects and accents. How about we then move across to the Northeast, and I give details on the Basque language and how it's different from Spanish? That seems logical, Stephanie. Do you also want to mention the other language in the northeast? It's Catalan, isn't it? Yes. In fact, we should say it's the official language of the region to show how important it is. So, what am I going to present? We need to include something about accents and speaking styles, don't we? Of course. I could explain the difficulties of understanding the accent in the south due to the fact that the locals speak quickly. Excellent. Well, I think that covers everything. Shall we meet tomorrow to practice our presentation? Track 30 So, Natalie, Louise, how are you doing with your report on encouraging people to speak local languages? Fine, thanks, Dr Phillips. It's been really interesting. We've found lots of information which we've collated for our report. Good. What are you going to focus on? Well, many schools and colleges are doing good work promoting local languages, both as qualifications and in terms of after-school clubs. 
And then there's the rise in popularity of minority language music, which seems to be driven by tourism. Tourists who are exposed to songs in indigenous languages become interested in learning those languages. OK, a y now you need to be careful with these topics. They are fascinating, but you need to look at the influences which drive language learning. Education doesn't leave people much choice, and music isn't a strong enough factor. Do you have any suggestions for us? Well, what did we talk about in last week's seminar? Can you remember any of the real push factors? Do you mean things like communication and relationships between companies and their workers? It's much more powerful than music, don't you think? Yes, I see what you mean. So, I suppose our other idea isn't very strong either. We also thought about hobby groups, but I'm beginning to think they're less significant. Yes, there aren't sufficient hobbyist groups to make a real difference to local language learning. But think about something else which is similar but reaches a much larger proportion of the population of a country or community. Ah, like online discussion groups. I remember in the lecture you talked about how the internet is fueling the increase in local languages through the World Languages Project. This is more appropriate for your report because we can actually measure the amount of correspondence in each language and chart increases and decreases over time, which makes it a more rigorous form of analysis. Of course. So we should definitely include that in our report. It's becoming clearer now. We need to write about the larger factors involving commerce and online communication where we can record language usage. I think it's better than looking at anecdotal information. Thanks, Dr Phillips. Track 31. Section 3. You will hear three students discussing a language project. First, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. So, we need to get this field trip sorted out as soon as possible, don't we? Yes. Let's get started. James, Have you worked out which two countries we should travel to? Well, I thought we could go to the USA and Mexico because that's where the populations of most native languages are concentrated. But then I found out that the three languages we're most interested in are more widely spoken in Canada than Mexico, so I think we should go there instead. OK. Anna, weren't you going to think about our research focus? Yes, and I think I found two areas that would work well. Firstly, use of the three languages, Nardani, Salishan and Algic, among the younger generation, people up to the age of 25. I found out that although there are many older speakers of Algic, it's used much less by the young. In fact, young people under the age of 25 use both Nardani and Salishan more than Algic. That's interesting. That means that native language use isn't really being affected by the older generations anymore. So, what's the other focus area then, Anna? Well, it would be good to try to find out what affects changes in native language speaker populations. You mean things like family life and the influence of popular culture or tourism? Yes, areas like that, but not tourism or culture because they're too general. I think we should look at whether family has an impact in terms of passing on native language use, and possibly the effects of government language policy too. Government figures can be deceptive, but they're still worth looking at. Maybe we should also focus on something like job creation and work statistics and the number of people who leave the USA to live in another country instead. Hmm, yes. I think emigration would be as useful as language policy. OK, then. Let's focus on those three, as well as what happens in families. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have 20 seconds to look at questions 7 to 10. Track 32. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Well, shall we look at our route now? Most of the speakers we're looking for are in California, so we could start there. We can spend two weeks travelling around and meeting people to get some background information and then start collecting data. What do you think about beginning in the southwest corner of the state and visiting the Barona Reservation? Mm, that's a good idea. We'll be able to get some interviews with native language speakers there. And then we could go to the eastern mountains to visit the local education authority of North County. 
they've got a native language project for school children. Why there? Wouldn't it be better to go to the education department in San Diego? It's bigger. But they focus more on Spanish and English bilingualism and less on native languages. In that case, the North County Education Authority will be more valuable, so let's do that. After that, we could head southeast to the town of Bishop. There's a company there called Cotec, which employs only bilingual speakers. I've emailed the managing director, who's happy to give us an interview. Oh, that's great work, James. It sounds like something we should definitely do. Right. Well, I'll email her to confirm. Also, we should go to Sun City. It's this bilingual town in the south central area of the region. They have a policy whereby all signs in the town must be in the local language as well as English. We can take photos of these signs. They'll make good visuals for our report. But won't that be intrusive for the people who live there? No, they're used to it. The village is used as a model for other communities who'd like to do the same thing. In that case, let's add it to the itinerary. Track 33. Practice exam. You will hear a number of different recordings and will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the questions and instructions and you will have a chance to check your answers. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a customer asking for help in a shop. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation related to this will be played first. Excuse me, where are the dresses? They're at the end of this aisle, on the left. Can I help you with anything? The assistant says the dresses are on the left, so left is written as the answer. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Excuse me, where are the dresses? They're at the end of this aisle, on the left. Can I help you with anything? Yes, maybe. I'm not from around here, so I don't know this store. Well, I can help you with anything you need. Fantastic. I'm actually down here for my brother's wedding, and I need something to wear. I've just started a new job, and I haven't had time to get anything yet. I'm looking for something smart. Maybe a new dress. Well, what about this one? I think it's too hot for long sleeves. Yes. Well, uh, this one has shorter sleeves, and it still has the bow, which I think is a nice detail. Uh, or there's this patterned one. I'm not keen on a pattern. I think I'll go for the one with the bow. Do you have it in a size 10? Let me have a look. Uh, yes, here. Great. I need a hat, and then I can try them on together. What kind of hat are you looking for? What about this one with the flower? Yes, but if I may suggest, a taller hat would add to your height. Really? Yes. Try this one. Oh, I see what you mean. We have this style with the single flower, or with a small bunch, and it comes with a, a wide or narrow brim. I like the narrow brim and just the one flower. Hmm, can I have a blue flower? I'm afraid it just comes in cream. Well, it goes with the dress anyway. Great. I'll place an order and have the hat sent to you. It'll take about two days to be delivered. Is that OK? Yes, that's fine. I need to take down a few details for delivery. Can I take your name? Ellen Barker. And the delivery address? It'll be my brother's address. It's 15... No, uh, 14 Brightwell Avenue. 14... Uh, can you spell that, please? Yes. B-R-I-G-H-T-W-E-L-L -L Avenue. Staybridge, Kent, D-A-4-7-D-F. And can I take a contact number? Yes, my mobile is 03221774. 03221775. No, it's a four at the end. Oh, sorry, I've got it now. 
We can deliver on May the 12th. We can't specify an exact time, just morning or afternoon. Any time in the early morning is fine. And how would you like to pay? Visa. Great. That comes to £32.25. OK, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Track 34. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. I'm just going to try this dress on and then look for shoes. Where are the changing rooms? They're to the left of the store, right next to customer services. And I want some shoes and accessories too. Where can I find them? The accessories are in the women's wear department. The shoe department is right at the front of the store, between men's wear and home furnishings. Oh, no, sorry, <laughs> we've just moved the shoe department for the summer season. It's now very near the changing rooms, actually, straight in front of them. Thanks so much for your help. And where can I pay for the other things? The cash desk is at the front of the store, by the men's wear. Thanks. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Track 35. Section 2. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Welcome to San Fernando City Tours. I'm Mark, your tour guide. We have a lot to see in three hours, so make sure you're comfortable. We'll be traveling into the historical district first and then into the town center. After that, it's out to the harbor, and we'll finish up at the lighthouse, just past the harbor. That will take us up to midday, and after that, you're free to do what you want. At the lighthouse, you'll have a chance to visit the tea room and take photographs of the magnificent coastline. Now, as we have only three hours, we won't be able to take you around the shopping district, but we think you'd prefer to look around the shops there in your own time anyway. San Fernando has some well-known tourist attractions, the Lighthouse, for example, and the National Library. However, the little-known Military Museum is not to be missed. Be sure to visit before you leave. Now, there's a lot to do in San Fernando. Indeed, there really is something for everyone. For those who love the water, I can recommend a trip on the Seafarer, one of the most famous boats on the San Fernando River. It does an evening trip with a three-course meal included. It's great fun for everyone, but especially for young people in their teens or twenties. After nine, there's a disco on the boat, and it gets really lively. Then there's a climbing wall near the town center. It's incredibly popular, with a large wall for expert climbers and a smaller wall for novices. There's a junior wall and a creche, so it's a great day out for those of you with kids. And if you like walking, there's some great walking tours. The city sites tour is highly recommended, as is the walking tour by the coast. But that one's only for the fit, not really suitable for children or the elderly. For more mature people, or those less able to get around, I would suggest a tour around the vineyards. It can be done in the luxury of a coach, and it's a wonderful way to explore the region's wines. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Track 36. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Naturally, there is a charge for all these attractions, but you can get 15% off if you have an Explorer Pass. If you don't have a pass but would like one, the driver here has application forms. Just ask him for one and fill it out while on the tour. Then you hand it into the tour office. Normally, it costs $10, but this year it's just $7. When you hand it in, you'll get your picture taken for the card on the spot, and then your card is ready to use. Remember to show it whenever you pay for anything. The discounts apply not just to tourist attractions, but some bars and restaurants. Basically, Everywhere you see a red explorer symbol.
Ah, we're coming up to the historical district now. If you'd like to look at That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Track 38. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, we were thinking of presenting each animal with a picture and describing their physical characteristics. OK, but not in too much detail. That's just background information. We'll start with the jaguar. I'll introduce it by saying that the jaguar is a nocturnal animal and the only species of the genus Panthera to be found in the Americas. Like any cat, it has whiskers and it can move quickly. Its spine has great movement, meaning a jaguar can take long strides, sometimes up to five and a half metres. This can make it a deadly predator, as you can imagine. Moving on to the fur, its fur is quite distinct. The markings are like black donut-shaped spots on its otherwise yellow fur. People often confuse them with a leopard for this reason. Now, the tail is interesting. Although people think that the tail has stripes on it, the fur on the tail actually is similar to the body, with black circles around the lower section. The jaguar is generally a creature to be feared. Oh yes, I should have mentioned this earlier. Sorry, like most cats, it has sharp, retractable claws. Yes, that's fine, but be careful. The jaguar is usually thought of as nocturnal, but strictly speaking, it's crepuscular. In other words, most active between dusk and dawn. But as long as you mention this, you can put it under the umbrella of nocturnal. Is that all? Yes, I think so. Thanks, Professor. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Track 39. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on time. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The subject of this series of lectures is horology, the science of measuring time, and we'll be looking at a few basic concepts in this lecture. The measurement of time has come a long way since ancient times. It began with such devices as the sundial, where the position of the sun's shadow marked the hour. Daylight was divided into twelve temporary hours. These temporary hours were longer in the summer and shorter in the winter, simply because the amount of daylight changes with the seasons. The earliest sundial we know comes from Egypt. It was made of stone and is thought to date from 1500 BC. Sundials were used throughout the classical world and, with time, evolved into more elaborate devices that could take into account seasonal changes and geographical positioning and reflect the hours accurately, no matter what the time of year. This was quite an achievement in technology. Today, sundials can be seen as decorative pieces in many gardens. In the 11th century, the Chinese invented the first mechanical clocks. They were large and expensive, and certainly not intended for individuals. However, this is the type of clock we are familiar with today. There have been many developments in clocks and watches since then, and they have been greatly improved. But if your clock or watch makes a ticking sound, then it could well be based on the mechanical movements the Chinese developed a thousand years ago. However, timekeeping has moved on from the mechanical clock. Time has become so important that there is a series of atomic clocks around the world which measure international atomic time. Even though many countries have their own calendars, globalization has made it essential that we measure time uniformly. That we know, for example, that when, that when it's 6 a.m. in the United Kingdom, it's 2 p.m. in Beijing. This standard was set in 1958. Now these atomic clocks are situated in over 70 laboratories all over the world. There is so much to cover about the development of time measurement that I would like to refer you to the reading list. The core text is The Development of Time, Theory and Practice, but there are many other useful texts. A good grounding in the subject is given in Understanding Time, 
by J. R. Beale, although some sections lack detailed analyses, it does offer a good foundation. Also, Time, Concepts and Conventions is quite a useful read. You might think from the title that it's about the philosophy of time, but this isn't the case. Rather, it gives a good description of how different countries have different approaches to time in terms of calendars and days. Lastly, The Story of Time by David Harris analyses time in great detail, and I would recommend this book if you are aiming to specialise in horology. Now, we're going to continue with an in-depth look at lunar and solar cycles. That is the end of the listening test. You now have half a minute to check your answers.